Hi, this is Mr. Kinzer, and I'm getting ready to have a session of literature. This is RGS Mid-High, Lesson 27. Today we begin our study of Ivanhoe. So today is an introduction to Ivanhoe, and this week you will be reading the first chapter and into the second chapter. If you want to go to the end of the second chapter, that would be great. And I know that we're using a couple different versions, uh, different editions of the book. There's a Bantam edition. There's a uh, another edition uh, by, uh, I think it's a Barnes & Noble edition. But uh, anyway, they, they, should, they, they should match up. You may also be reading this on... Uh, the internet you can you can uh, download and and read uh, a version on the internet. So we're going to just kind of stick to the chapters so everybody knows where we are. We're going to be beginning with chapter one. And this this book Ivanhoe is a beautiful book. It's one of my favorite books. I think it's an exciting book because it is uh, about knights, about um, the Crusades. It's about England under the Normans. And of course the Normans are from France. They've invaded England back in uh, 1066 AD. And so uh, at this point the Normans have brought in their rule to England. And the English, the Anglo-Saxons, really hate these Normans who have uh, brought them under their rule. The Normans have brought in French language the Anglo-Saxons can understand that. Uh, they bring in castles and chivalry and, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the tournaments and the contests. All of that is from the continent of Europe down in France. And they bring that into England when they invade England in 1066. Probably the most hated thing that they bring in is that now the French own everything. The Normans own everything. And uh, they own all the land. Uh, none of the English retain their titles to the land. And the English, the Anglo-Saxons, are a very freedom-loving tribal uh, people. They have various tribes, and they, uh, uh, they, they own land, and they have uh, much freedom to... Uh, travel and to go where they want, and now the French have taken all that away. So right there, you have a conflict. And so one of the conflicts that we see in this book, and I'm just going to put down Ivanhoe uh, as we read it together here. Ivanhoe is uh, a wonderful book, uh, really learning about the Middle Ages. If you like uh, knights and castles, and if you like uh, the uh, the culture and the way the people lived and learning about uh, the Middle Ages, this is one of the best books. Uh, I think it is maybe the best book. It's my favorite book, and incidentally, it also introduces us to Robin Hood and Friar uh, John, uh, or um, Friar Tuck and Little John and. Uh, a Sherwood Forest. So these are figures that come right out of this book. And so uh, Sir Walter Scott has uh, written about these great uh, people. So let's go ahead and look at uh, chapter one. If you turn to it, uh, it might be your page one. I think it is in most of your versions. Notice that he starts out with chapter one, a quote at the beginning from Pope, and it's the Odyssey. And he likes to start each chapter with um, this, uh, with a different quote. So I'm going to be writing some notes, and you take those down, and you can all, always put your, uh, your, uh, your machine on pause, and you can write those notes, and you can uh, rewind and you can listen to this again if you miss something or just pause it and make sure you get all these notes and of course these notes go on to uh, into your notes for literature and let's go ahead and put the date the date is 317 if you're the Tuesday class or 
it's 319. If you're the Thursday class, go ahead and put those dates and then circle that. So it's March 17 or March 19. This quote is real interesting. Thus communed these, while to their lowly dome the full-fed swine returned with evening home. Compelled, reluctant to the several styes, with din obstreperous and ungrateful cries. So this is just describing in the evening them herding the swine, the pigs, into these styes. And the uh, pigs don't want to go in. They, uh, they have ungrateful cries. And so this is a little bit of a picture of the Middle Ages. They herded pigs. Pigs were easy to herd, and they would root and uh, go around eating just about everything. Pigs will eat just about anything. And so they're easy to take through the woods and, um, and, uh, and uh, you know, get them to eat just about anything. So we see this little uh, poem at the beginning of each chapter. So this gives you a clue that chapter one is going to talk something about pigs and pig herding and uh, swine. And of course, that's what they did. That was one of their big foods at the time was pork. So let's take a look at the page one, first paragraph. I'm going to go ahead and read. In that pleasant district of Merry England, which is watered by the River Don, there extended in ancient times a large forest, covering the greater part of the beautiful hills and valleys which lie between Sheffield and the pleasant town of Doncaster. Now, I'd underline those towns, Sheffield and Doncaster. The remains of this extensive wood are still to be seen at the noble seats of Wentworth, of Farncliffe Park, and around Rotherham. Here, haunted of yore, the fabulous dragon of Wantley. Here were fought many of the most desperate battles during the civil wars of the Roses. And here also flourished in ancient times those bands of gallant outlaws whose deeds have been rendered so popular in English song. So here's a, a hint of what we're going to see. We're going to learn about outlaws here. So I'm going to write a couple things down that I think are pretty important. Uh, looks like I'm goofing up here uh, with my uh, writing. Yeah, let me try that again. There we go. I'm going to uh, mention outlaws. For forest. Let's do forest first. And notice his word extensive. Extensive forest. Uh, big part of England. England known for those extensive forests. And Sheffield. And we also have Doncaster. This is uh, the towns near by these great forests. And of course he mentions the outlaws, which we're going to run into. Very famous. So let's continue. Such being our chief scene. Oh, by the way, this first paragraph, what would be the, uh, uh, what is, is the, uh, is this a theme? Is it a setting? In other words, what elements do we see here? Well, if you said setting, you'd be right, because that's describing this area. It's giving some of the place names. It's talking about the forest. So if you would mark there in your margin, setting, for that very first paragraph. And uh, remember, we have five elements of literature. Plot, theme, style, setting, and character. And so setting is the description of the surroundings. It's the, uh, what, what the time and the place uh, where the event takes place. It's a description of those things. So let's look at this second paragraph. Such being our chief scene, the date of our story refers to a period towards the end of the reign of Richard I. Now, would you underline Richard I? He's also known as Richard the Lion-Hearted, and he's a Norman. 
And so he speaks French, and the uh, French term for lion-hearted is coeur de lion. So he's Richard, he's Richard Coeur de Lion, uh, the heart of a lion. So heart of the lion. And so his return, notice it says his return from his long captivity had become an event rather wished than hoped for by his despairing subjects who were in the meantime subjected to every species of subordinate oppression. So would you underline oppression? His subjects of, while he's gone, he's been on a crusade. He was in the third crusade, but he's on a crusade to rescue the Holy Land from the Muslims, and uh, the people had taken it over and to wrestle it back, put it in Christian hands. He's uh, now, after six years of being in prison, as a captive, he's coming home. So this is a big deal. You might want to underline this. This is important to the story. But the other thing that's important is to note that people were oppressed under the Normans. So you remember, maybe from your history, that uh, Richard's brother, John, Prince John, was left in charge, and he has imp- in, in, uh, oppressed them. Now, that's pretty uh, famous because we even have the story of Robin Hood and, of course, Walt Disney's Robin Hood that we're, we've all seen, where King John is this wicked, uh, kind of wimpy guy, and then Richard is this powerful warrior, and he was. He was... The lion's heart. He was the heart of the lion. So let's go to the text. Let's continue. The nobles, whose power had become exorbitant during the reign of Stephen, and whom the prudence of Henry II had scarce reduced into some degree of subjection to the crown, had now resumed their ancient license in its utmost extent. So the nobles have become what? They're they're showing their license. They have a freedom to do whatever they want. And so that's bad. The people are not protected from these nobles. So we're getting this setting where we have the king who's been absent. His brother has been in charge, and he's allowed the nobles to become oppressive. Let's see how that looks. Now, as we continue there, it says, despising the feeble interference of the English Council of State. So they despised the English Council. They didn't pay attention. Number two here, fortifying their castles. So they've been fortifying. Number three, increasing the number of their dependents. In other words, they're becoming stronger by getting dependents. Uh, Lower uh, classes of the English dependent on them and then reducing all around them to a state of vassalage. So vassalage means that you are a noble, and uh, the vassals are the ones who are your kind of servants. They're your they're indentured slaves. So vassals serve the noble. Vassals serve the noble. And these nobles have gotten out of control, they've gotten a lot of power, and now they're oppressing people. Okay, So this is the picture of what's been going on. Now let's drop to the next paragraph, the, the third paragraph in the story. The situation of the inferior gentry, or Franklins, now we know Benjamin Franklin, uh, here's the first mention of this word Franklins. Franklins are landed, uh, are owners of land. They are, uh, you know, they they are landed. They they have title to land, but these guys are now losing their land to the Normans. So they're inferior gentry, or Franklins, as they were called. 
who by the law and spirit of the English Constitution were entitled to hold themselves independent of feudal tyranny, became now unusually precarious. So they're losing, in this picture here, they're losing their rights, they're losing their land, and while they are still kind of a notch above the common people, they're losing, they're kind of being swallowed up by these Norman lords, okay? Let's continue. If, as was almost generally the case, they placed themselves under the protection of any of the petty kings in their vicinity, they accepted a feudal offices in his household or bound themselves by mutual treaties of alliance and protection to support him in his enterprises. So they're coming under these nobles. So these Franklins, who were completely independent before, are now under these nobles who are stronger and stronger, and they are more and more oppressing the people. Well, let's continue, and it says that they bound themselves by mutual treaties of alliance and protection to support him, the noble, in their enterprises. They might indeed purchase temporary repose. Now, repose means rest, so you could mark that, rest. But it must be with the same sacrifice of that independence which was so dear to every English bosom. Okay, I would underline that. You see the sacrifice, they're sacrificing their independence so dear to every English bosom. I would mark that, I would write in your margin, theme. Here's one of the great themes of the book. And we see that the English love of liberty, they the love of freedom. And now they're finding that freedom being taken away by these French lords who are now becoming more and more, um, what? Yeah, oppressive. Let's go to the next paragraph. A circumstance which greatly tended to enhance the tyranny of the nobility and the suffering of the inferior classes arose from the consequences of the conquest by Duke William of Normandy. So this is 1066 when William, who's also known William the Conqueror, came in and he brought in much tyranny. So I would underline this section as well. Let's make a note that William of Normandy, William the Conqueror, was bringing in, he brought in tyranny. We mentioned before that he is going to take all the land. The people and the land will be his subjects and he and will belong to him. Okay? So he is oppressive. And of course he comes into England winning England at the Battle of Hastings in 1066 AD. Okay, so this goes way back. This is a big change. The freedom loving English are now being uh, conquered by the French, the Normans. Four generations had not sufficed to blend the hostile blood of the Normans and Anglo-Saxons or to unite by common language and mutual interest two hostile races. There you go, two hostile races. I'd underline that. One of which still felt the elation of triumph, that would be the Normans, while the other groaned under all the consequences of defeat. There you have the English. The power had been completely placed in the hands of the Norman nobility by the event of the Battle of Hastings, and it had been used, as our histories assure us, with no moderate hand. Underline this next sentence. The whole race of Saxon princes and nobles had been er extirpated or disinherited, with few or no exceptions. Nor were the numbers great who possessed land in the king in the country of their fathers, even as proprietors of the second or of yet inferior classes. The royal policy had long been we to weaken by any means, every means, legal or illegal, the strength of a part of the population 
which was justly considered as nourishing the most inveterate antipathy to their victor. In other words, the, the Normans are trying to wipe out any, um, what, any resistance to their tyranny. So they're hostile. They, these are two hostile races. The Normans don't like the English, and the English hate the Normans because they've taken away their liberty. Okay? All the monarchs of the Norman race had shown the most marked predilection for their Norman subjects. The laws of the chase and many others, equally unknown to the milder and more free spirit of the Saxon constitution, had been fixed upon the necks of the subjugated inhabitants to add weight, as it were, to the feudal chains which were they were loaded. So it's as though they, you know, uh, Sir Walter Scott is saying they've been loaded down with feudal chains. So they've been really uh, hindered. Now let's take a look. Here's an example. At court and in the castles of the great nobles, where the pomp and state of a court was emulated, Norman French was the only language employed. In the courts of law, now say the English don't know Norman French, so they're not even going to be able to argue their case in the court. So see, that's how oppressive it was. They, they were really being controlled by the Normans. It says here that in courts of law, the pleadings and judgments were delivered in the same tongue, in French. In short, French was the language of honor, of chivalry, and even of justice, while the far more manly and expressive Anglo-Saxon was abandoned to the use of rustics and hinds who knew no other. So in other words, just the common people used English. Okay? So we see that the English language is now going to be, with these Normans uh, in control, words, uh, French words, are going to make their way into our vocabulary. So it's going to enrich English, but right now it's oppressing the Anglo-Saxons, these uh, uh, Englishmen who've been used to freedom. Now, let's drop down uh, two paragraphs to now where the story uh, kind of takes off with two figures walking through the woods. This is where it's kind of fun. Uh, the, the description of these two, uh, Girth and uh, his friend who's with him, we'll be talking about that in our next section. So you'll be needing to proceed over to the next, uh, the part two for literature. Thank you.